India recently conducted an anti-satellite weapons test in Mission Shakti. I have with me Victoria Sampson, director of the Washington leg of the Secure World Foundation, a body which looks at outer space and the sustainable use of outer space. Uh, Victoria, what was your first reaction when you heard India conducting an ASAT test? Well, we thought for many years that India would potentially hold an anti-satellite test if India thought there was a possibility of some sort of ban on the issue. Just because India is still very upset about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which left it as a non-nuclear weapon state officially. Um, and so they wanted, we, it was our understanding that India would want to be grandfathered in as an anti-satellite country, so to speak, if there was some sort of ban on it. And so when I woke up and read the news and heard that India had finally had their test, we're like, okay, it finally happened. It's something we thought might be a possibility, and it did happen. Uh, that they conducted it in a low Earth orbit, did it give you any confidence? No, it did not. Um, that the concern about an ASAT test is that you can do your best to try and make sure the debris is short-lived, um, that it's a low enough orbit that it will come down into orbit naturally fairly soon. Um, but, you know, things happen. You're never really entirely sure what's going to happen. Uh, for example, in India's test, the angle of interception was a little bit upwards, and so it ended up kicking a couple dozen pieces of debris up high uh, to an orbit where they may be there for a year, a year and a half, two years, or what have you, and it's a high enough orbit that when it comes back down, it may go past the space station, which, you know, there are humans on board. That's something to be concerned about. So that's the first concern. The second concern is just the general idea if you try and have the proliferation of ASAT technologies or ASAT tests and make that an acceptable thing to happen, at some point, someone's going to screw up or someone's not going to be a good actor, or someone's not going to be trying to do it responsibly, and they're going to have an altitude where they may actually endanger other satellites or endanger humans in orbit. And I think that's just not a sustainable or safe way to ensure that space is usable for everyone over the long term. With over 100 million pieces of debris, 300 by India, should that be a big concern for the world, or is it just trying to beat a dead horse for India? Um, it's not meant against India. When the United States had an ASAT test in 2008, um, I was critical and many people were critical of it for the exact same reason. When China had their ASAT test in 2007, I and other people were critical for the same thing. It's not necessarily the sheer number. Yes, space is large, but orbits can be very um, tight. And also, you don't want to have things getting close to other satellites because I think people think we have a really good picture of what's going on up there. We know exactly where everything is. We can move things. We can shift around. You know, it's like on the freeway. You can zip your car around if you need to. That's not the case. We have a general concept where things are. We have a general concept of the amount of debris that's up there. We don't know where everything is. We don't know all the debris is. And if you're looking at satellites that are up there, you want to make sure they're up there and that you're able to use them. And if you have debris up there either you don't know about, or you can't maneuver around, or something happens, it can be very dangerous, again, to satellites that are up there and to people that may be in orbit. I always think of Ecuador. They launched their satellite, their very first satellite, and within weeks it was taken out by a piece of debris. I mean, that's a huge investment for Ecuador, and it's lost for no concern of their own. And they're not the only country that has an issue. India has a huge investment in its space capabilities. It's put a lot of effort into making sure it's a responsible space actor. It can be all wiped out by a debris, piece of debris in the wrong place. Uh, but do you think ever these weapons would be used, these kinetic impact weapons? Because you can go after one satellite. People are talking of thousands of satellites and swarms. How do you take each one out? Right. I mean, I don't think anyone anticipates that every single active satellite, all 2,000 of them, will be taken out at the same time. But there is a concern that satellites that are not, um, sensitive and for national security purposes could be interfered with. Um, and that could have long-term consequences where a country uses it for maybe missile warning. And if that satellite is no longer accessible, they have to assume that's been interfered with a deliberate way, perhaps by someone who's sending a missile launch their way, and then they respond accordingly. But also, again, people tend to focus on the kinetic aspects of ASAT tests. The thing is, your assets are important because they're sharing information with you. And if you can't get that information, then that's a threat to you, whether it's being um, interfered with from a kinetic way or if it's being interfered with by being jammed or electronic interference. And the fact of the matter is, electronic interference or jamming happens now. 
And it's concerning because there's no really laws of armed conflict for space, like there are for the air domain, for terrestrial, for maritime. Space doesn't have it yet. Now, there are a couple organizations that are working on that sort of thing, but they haven't come down to the conclusions yet. And so it's very possible, without the laws of armed conflict very clear in terms of where the red lines are for space, you could accidentally escalate to a time where hostilities on the Earth extend into space or vice versa. If America, Russia, and China can have space commands, they're hoping, or I shouldn't say hoping, but people say future wars would be in space. India preparing for that, what's wrong with it? Well, again, I would like to really clarify what the U.S. Space Force is intended to do. It's not intended to have starship troopers or people fighting each other in space. It's the idea that space is an enabler for national security purposes, and therefore military space needs to have its efforts coordinated. And so really, it's a bureaucratic discussion. Um, and so I don't think anyone has an issue with India having a command that coordinates its space capabilities, particularly since India is so recent to the idea of military use of space. India historically has been a peaceful power using space for development purposes for civil research and that sort of thing. There's, I don't think anyone's had any issues with, with India trying to coordinate its national security space capabilities. I think the concern is that it's establishing a precedent and making and, and allowing the proliferation of these anti-satellite technologies in a manner that could not be sustainable over the long term. Uh, we saw various different re responses from various different agencies in America. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reactions which came was from the chief of NASA, Jim Bernstein, and he called it a terrible, terrible test. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Secure World Foundation uh, kind of endorse the NASA chief's view that India's test was a terrible, terrible test? Right, for, for the Secure World Foundation does not take organizational positions on that matter, so I will be speaking for myself. Um, yeah, I think NASA came out swinging on this issue because they have people on the space station currently, and there's debris from this test that went north of the, uh, went extended farther out to higher altitudes. Higher altitudes. Higher altitudes, higher orbits. And so that could potentially affect life on the space station. And so I, don't, I understand why the NASA administrator was very upset about this sort of thing. But I will point out, you know, the United States is not a monolithic entity. There are various organizations with different viewpoints. And the State Department had a very restrained response. It was like, yes, we see that it happened. India is a strategic partner and we look forward to working on blah, 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 blah. You know, and so I think where you stand on this depends on where you sit, I guess. I, I guess some things have changed after the Pokhran test of 1998 and the Indo-US civilian nuclear deal. As a, from the Secure World Foundation, do you see India was treated like a dog in the uh, a paria state? Has that changed for India after the Indo-US civilian nuclear deal? Especially the ASAT test, the response was very muted compared to the 1998 nuclear weapons test. Right. I mean, the response to the ASAT test was very muted, not only by the United States, but a lot of countries. I think the only countries that I saw that came out officially critical of the ASAT test by India um, was Germany, um, China, and Pakistan. Uh, the United States officially, as I said, the State Department was very muted in their response. Um, I, I think that's acknowledging we're in a different political environment than we were 20 years ago. And you have different um, interests and different allies and different ways in which to go about accomplishing those interests. So I, I'm not speaking for the United States government, but this is my analysis of what they were saying, is they probably made a critical decision looking at the cost benefit of too harshly criticizing India and decided it was too costly to try and criticize them more than what they already did. Having said that, I'm hoping that India will step up as a responsible space actor and be a leader in discussions about norms of behavior and how to make sure um, actions are responsible in space and following the SASAT test. What about the other countries? How, how does the whole dialogue on non-weaponization of space go on from here onwards after you have a fourth country which has done its anti-satellite weapons test? Right, well, you know, this actually may be an incentive for countries to be a participant in this conversation because before there were only really three countries that had done anti-satellite tests, the United States, um, Soviet Union, and now Russia, and then China. And you know the, the latest tests were from 2007, 2008. So we had a decade of just theoretically speaking this could happen. Okay, we had a country that did it. Now we need to figure out where do we go from here. 
So I think there are a lot of countries that before it was just strictly a, almost a theoretical discussion and now there's an actual point you can look at and say, okay, this is happening. We need to figure out what's going on. As well, nature of space is changing. It's undergoing a huge change right now um, in terms of thousands of mega constellations being launched or thousands of satellites being launched in a mega constellation. You have new uses of space, you have a lot of new actors of space, and you have countries like India who are launching for the PSLV, doing a tremendous job launching multiple satellites at one time for many countries. Um, I think I read that they've launched them for 32 countries. So things are changing, and this is, change can be a disruption, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, but I would like to think that with this change, we're using it as incentive to try and have a more cooperative international approach so that this change can be beneficial to all. In your opinion, uh, from the Secure World Foundation, which are the other threshold countries which have the capability to do anti-satellite weapons tests? Uh, let's look at first the kinetic approach. Sure. All right. So from my opinion, not Secure World Foundation's opinion, but my opinion, um, <clears throat> It is possible, you know, Russia has tested co-orbital anti-satellite tests, but as far as I know, they've never had a kinetic energy ASAT test. They might decide they just want to check that box. Um, also, never count out Israel. And then, I mean, really looking at this, the countries that have had these, these um, anti-satellite tests are the one with missile defense programs. And so that's countries like Israel, like Japan, in theory could do it, I don't know if they will. Um, Countries that have um, the THAAD program that for the United States, countries that have the PAC-3 interceptor. I mean, technically, having a missile defense interceptor does not mean you automatically have an ASAT capability. The tracking and targeting is a huge part of that. Not every country has that. But it is possible it could be proliferated. Uh, what about the other ways of disabling satellites? A kinetic uh, hit is only one approach. Uh, from the Secure World Foundation, what are the approaches you are looking at and how can we mitigate those? We put out a counter space threat assessment this year um, that looks at different ways in which satellites could be interfered with. And as you said, kinetic is not the only way. You can have directed energy, you could have cyber attacks, you could have electronic interference, you can have close approach rendezvous and proximity operations where a satellite gets up close and interferes with via looking at or disabling or otherwise jamming stuff. So those are all different ways in which that could happen. And as I said, electronic interference is happening now. Radio frequency interference happens now. Everyone does it because it's handy and it's something you can do. Um, in terms of directed energy, uh, um, we have uh, several sections in our th threat assessment that looks at various countries' capabilities. And cyber, again, it's one of those things that's tricky because everyone has that capability. Is it actually happening? It's really difficult and hard to say just because of the secrecy aspects as well. But generally speaking, it's understood that cyber attacks are pretty proliferated. Yeah, but directed uh, a kinetic hit is probably the toughest thing to do. Why did India have to do that? They could have quietly gone on doing whatever they needed to do. India is an IT superpower for cyber. Right. I agree. India did not have to do a kinetic energy ASAT test to demonstrate their space power um, status. You know, India already is a space power um, in terms of its ability to launch multiple satellites at one time, you know, the decades of scientific research it's been doing, its moon program, its Mars orbiter. You know, India has already established itself as a space power, did not need to do this to demonstrate its space power capability. I think really it was, you know, a couple things. One, it's a concern about China wanting to keep up with its neighbors, and then also never discount the idea of domestic politics having a strong role to play here. So you think domestic politics and the elections which are ongoing played a role? Well, I don't think it was specifically tied to the elections because this decision was made in 2014. So this has been going on for a while. But I think... Do you want me to stop? Go ahead. Okay. But I think... Um, they you were talking about whether elections had a role in the ASAT test or not. No. So what I think is I don't think the elections were the single point of consideration for having an ASAT test. Having said that, I think the ruling government wanted to get the political win of having an ASAT test. And um, if they had it before the elections, you know, well, that's just a, a, a benefit for them. Um, you know, the only criticism I've seen in Indian newspapers about the test is that, well, we didn't have it earlier. Uh, it's seen as such a strong domestic political consideration for the ruling power. So you think India went the right direction? 
I really wish they hadn't had the ASAT test. I think it's going to be challenging in the future. I think it just complicates discussions, and I think it leads the way for possible proliferation of ASAT testing. Um, so I'm hoping India will recognize that there could be negative consequences of their tests and become a real leader in international discussions and making sure that space is safe and stable for everyone over the long term. Uh, there were also talks that there was a failed test in February. Uh, did, did your team look at that particular point and what was the understanding? Well, we only had heard the same reports everyone else heard. Um, and it depends, of course, who you talk to, whether it was meant to be a missile. You know, if you look back at news reports when it first happened in February, it was a missile defense interceptor test that was successful. And you say, well, success, it had electronic, uh, um, an interceptor was launched. Um, it successfully interacted with this electronic target. And that was it. And then, you know, after the ASAT test came out, they said, well, actually, um, it was, a, yes, it was a missile defense interceptor that was launched. I'm still not sure what kind of target was launched, whether it was electronic or actual. But the implication is that it was meant to test the same interceptor that was used for the ASAT capabilities, except in the February test, it was not successful. The interceptor um, failed about 30 seconds into the flight. And so we don't really know. But if you look at the notice for airmen, what they put out before a test is say, okay, FYI, sharp things are whizzing around here. You don't want to be in this area. It was the same notice to airmen area that was in February as was for the March test. And it was the same interceptor in February as was for the March test. So um, it is very possible it was a practice run that just didn't go as far as the Indian government may have wanted. But right now it's really hard to say. It's a one-off test till now. Do you expect India to do more tests? If you have to have a reliable system, you need to have more testing. You, the armies won't accept any of this unless there is more testing. Uh, I mean, it is possible that the Indian government may decide to have more tests, but I think the point has been made with this one test. They had the, the launch, they had the intercept, they can say to the you know, domestic political considerations, hey, we have an ASAC capability, we're safe. Um, so I don't see the benefit of having multiple tests. Um, but what I think probably India will do is continue to test the same interceptor, but in a missile defense capacity. Um, which means it's being launched against ballistic missile targets, not satellite targets. But you can learn from those tests and you can apply them to future stuff. And so you can increase that capability without necessarily demonstrating it's a satellite. You know, frankly, that's what the United States does. That's what China does. Uh, we use our missile defense interceptors, which have been used for satellite capabilities, but using missile defense tests, those seem to be okay. So I expect India to follow the same um, pattern of behavior there. So that was Victoria Sampson from the Secure World Foundation telling us that India tested the ASAT weapon probably as a way of not getting into the same situation it did on the NPT and wanted to be part of the organization or the laws which are going to be set up for strategizing outer space in New Delhi, Palav Bagla.